In Europe, Victor Schauberger's vortex experiments during the 1930s resulted in an advanced understanding of how the spiraling motions inherent in all natural systems reverse the effects of entropy. By studying the properties of inwardly spiraling water, he created an implosion generator that concentrated electrical charge. Victor Schauberger is one of my heroes who talked about a, a possible science based on the, the uh, inward motion rather than the let's explode everything, blow, break it up and, and uh, study the atom by breaking it up into little pieces. Let's study the atom by looking at uh, how it wants to move naturally in a spiraling motion. And the same with uh, everywhere you look in nature. Schauberger's ideas became widely known before World War II when he was coerced to work for the Nazis on exotic discs that resembled flying saucers, as well as his energy generator. In 1958, he traveled to the United States where he was told he could manufacture his devices. But he was duped into signing over all of his rights, and none of his inventions were ever developed. Returning to Austria, he died a bitter and broken man. Visionary philosopher, artist, and scientist Walter Russell's contributions to the understanding of energy are significant, even though ignored by mainstream academia. Russell's revised periodical table of the elements, based on a spiral, predicted many unknown elements and isotopes like plutonium and deuterium. His cosmological theories about the mystical nature of reality challenged physicists to think in terms of energy, light, and matter as one substance. planet's forces, perhaps none has greater power over us than water. For me, water's the most magical force on Earth. The presence of water shapes, renews and nourishes our planet. Oh my gosh, you get all wet there. It's our planet's lifeblood. It pumps through it continuously, delivering vital ingredients for life. Ah, it's glorious. Water makes Earth alive. Yet water is just one of the ways that the power of the planet has shaped our lives. The Earth has immense power. No! And yet, that's rarely mentioned in our history books. I'm here to change that. In this series, I'm exploring four great planetary forces that have influenced our history. The power of the deep earth. <laughs> that fuel technological innovation. Wind. <laughs> it has shaped the fate of entire continents. And fire. Which gave us the power to conquer the planet. But this time, it's water. The magic of water is that it's constantly transforming itself, shifting between guises and from place to place. Our struggle to control it has been behind the rise and fall of some of the greatest civilizations on Earth. center of the Sahara Desert in North Africa. One of the driest places on Earth. I'm 
over six hours' drive from civilization. Temperatures here regularly reach 40 degrees Celsius, and there's less than a centimetre of rainfall each year. Ah. Whole thing's moving. Ah. It's like walking on water. Yet, hidden amongst these dry dunes are clues that point to the dramatic influence the planet has had on human lives. I've come here because although you'd never know it, the story of this place is all about water. The clues are etched into that rock face there. Prehistoric rock art dating back 6,000 years and depicting the most unlikely cast of characters you've ever seen. Wow, what is that? It's a giraffe. It's a giraffe, look at it. There's a neck. There's its ears, look at that, it's an eye, it's a mouth. That's really natural, isn't it? And this looks like a giraffe dipping its head down, drinking some water. We've got a herd of giraffes here. Looks like two cats. They're fighting. This. What is this? It looks like a figure of a, looks like a, figure of a man, but he's wearing a bikini. And this is clearly a crocodile, which is especially odd here. This is an aquatic animal. It doesn't just paddle around. It needs a lot of water to live in. In fact, all the creatures that are depicted on these rocks are not desert animals. They need wet conditions. In such a parched wilderness, how can this be? The only explanation is that 6,000 years ago, this place was wet. Once you know what to look for, the evidence is all around. Up there is a river valley that's been carved out into the rock, and it's been carved by running water. It just flowed down here, smoothing off this rock bed, and then cascaded down into the valley and off there. 6,000 years ago, that was a big river. Satellite images reveal that the riverbed I'm standing in is just one of a network of past river valleys that crisscross the Sahara Desert. Ten thousand years ago, this dry, empty place was entirely different. Little is known about the early Saharans who lived here then, but we do know that they depended entirely on water. Water formed the lakes in which they swam. Water nourished the plants which fed the animals they hunted. Water filled the clay pots from which they drank. But then the climate changed. About five and a half thousand years ago, the Sahara began to dry. The rains failed, the rivers shrank, and the lakes dried out. For the early Saharan people, there was only one option, to follow the rains and abandon the desert. The fortunes of the early Saharan people reveal a universal, timeless truth. Our fate is inextricably linked to water. The problem is, water never stands still. It's always on the move across the planet. We think of this as a blue planet, 
but while water is abundant, most of it is no use. More than 97% of the Earth's water is salty ocean, which we can't drink or use to grow crops. Less than 3% is fresh water, on which all human life hangs. What's more, that tiny fraction is often hard to pin down, because fresh water has a life cycle all of its own. I'm about to explore that cycle in all its elusive glory. The water seems so familiar, doesn't it? But to see its remarkable qualities, you have to go to some extreme lengths. Here we go. Whoa, feel that. Here we go. Oh, oh we're off. Oh, my God. Oh, it's a bit bouncy. I should have had that bacon and eggs this morning. The fresh water that we depend on begins its life in the oceans. As the sun's rays beat down on the surface of the sea, they heat the water molecules until some evaporate. It's the start of an extraordinary journey. You know, when water evaporates, it feels like it vanishes into thin air, but although we barely notice it, water molecules are suspended around us all the time. Just that we're only aware of it when they clump together as cloud. At any one time, less than a thousandth of the world's fresh water is up here in the atmosphere. It may not seem much, but this is what spreads water from the seas to the land. A water molecule doesn't hang around up here for very long. In fact, it spends less time up here in the atmosphere than at any other time in its journey. A mere nine days until the typical water molecule crashes to Earth as rain. For most of us, rain is perhaps the most familiar stage of the water cycle, but notoriously the least reliable. When the water falls as rain, it joins a bigger system, cascading and carving its way across the land surface as streams and rivers 